Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Gagno Atelier. I'm your old pal, Tim Gagno, and today we've got the best show. I'm so excited. You have no idea. I know I always say I'm excited, but today I am extra excited because today I have my friend, Simi Jackson from Rosemary and Company Brushes. <laughs> I'm so excited. I almost exploded. Did you hear it? Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, today we're going to be talking about paint brushes. You know, my dad always said the right tool for the right job. You know, you, you don't, you don't use a screwdriver as a hammer. And, uh, you know, that's a lot of people try that. It doesn't work, you know? Um, and so, or they're using a, a, you know, they're using a butter knife to unscrew something. That, that's a bad idea. So using the right tool for the right job is a big, important thing. And a lot of artists don't think about the number one tool in your drawer is the paintbrush. And so with that said, we're going to be talking about paintbrushes. And uh, this is actually one of their paintbrushes right here. And uh, we're going to be talking about all kinds of things. But first thing I want to do is I want to show you this great video that is going to explain to you all about their thing. But before we do that, let's make sure that you remember to do me a favor and hit the like button on this video. If you're watching on Facebook, Go ahead and share this video, or if you can do what I'm about to do, as I do every week, I'm going to go over to my page on the Gagno Atelier page, and I'm going to find the video that is playing right now, and I am going to do a watch party on my page, and there it is. I'm putting it on my timeline. Start, and boom. I am doing a watch party. Go ahead and share this there video, it is. or if you can... You heard it. I was. You heard my voice and my voice again. That's because I just did a watch party on my page. Now, what a watch party does, if you don't remember uh, or you don't know, period, <laughs> is that a watch party will actually send an invitation to all your friend list. And what it'll do is it'll say, hey, Tim Gagno is hosting a watch party. And there'll be a little button that says you're invited to watch with them. Click here. And then your friends can click that button and watch this video with you and so that that's pretty cool so again hit the like button hit the share button if you can do a watch a watch party and also don't forget go over to our youtube channel because we have got we have got on our youtube channel um all kinds of great videos but uh in the month of may especially we are going to be taking every single modern master podcast that we've done already in the past on facebook live and we're going to be re-airing them permanently on the Gagno Atelier YouTube channel. So if you can go to YouTube, check out the Gagno Atelier and hit the subscribe button and the notification button, that would really help us out. So with that said, guys, let's go ahead and we are going to watch this video here. You guys are going to love it. It's a really good video. It's a creativity of me being able to manufacture and make something from start to finish and when they pick up our brushes with my name on the handle and they start to paint with it, I love it when I hear them say, this has changed my life. And I like to think now that I've given them a tool they can't blame. And it's amazing to see how their art changes. They're not just picking up a brush anymore, they're picking up an extension of their arm, an extension of their eye, of their vision. And I really feel strongly that I've actually tried to create some magic. I was brought up in the countryside and I was brought up before the days of laptops and computers. So we literally used to go outside and play. I used to paint. I was an oil artist. As I used to paint, my brother was into fly fishing and I would make Philip's ties for him, his, his fishing flies and tie them off. I can remember this one day and I said, how can I paint when I'm painting with utter rubbish? And he just looked at me and he said, well, you can make fishing flies while you make your own brushes. That was it. Never discussed it any further and it, it preyed on my mind a little bit. And in those days, if something happened to somebody in the village, they would pile all the stuff outside the garage. An elderly lady in the village, bless her, passed away. She was a phenomenal oil artist. They left all her uh, kit outside and I just made a beeline. And I actually bought the most magnificent set of brushes, canvas, easel, the lot. Got the brushes home, and in those days, folks used to make them with 
um, an aluminium ferrule, which is like rolled around and wrapped and tied. So I literally peeled these brushes open just to see the construction of how they were made. And it just became so obvious to me that if you can make fly fishes, you can actually make brushes. The folks in Stoke-on-Trent, the potteries, wanted to buy English. They didn't want to buy French or German, so they supported me. So I literally started out by anything I could get my hands on, like cornflake boxes were brilliant, or orange squash bottles, anything I could put the brushes in, pad them out and throw them in the post and know they were going to get there safe, was how I did it. I remember Mum used to say, could you put some stamps on some packets for me? So me and my brother used to get, you know, 12 or 15 packets a day, and we would literally go to the Royal Mail and get stamps and start sticking them on. To think that we've gone from 15 packets a day to, you know, a good day could be 180, 250 packets a day. It didn't just stop then at supplying the UK and Europe. I decided I'm going to go to the States. Richard Schmidt was at that event, he was the headliner. And Richard Schmidt said, well, I've just met a new lady a new, from England, her name's Rosemary, and I don't think I'll ever use another brush now. And he picked them up and started painting with these three brushes. and. He finished his demo and within 20 minutes of him finishing, I'd sold everything I took. Because I'm passionate about art, this isn't just business for me. This is my love, my life. It's a hobby of mine that turned into this business. And my dream was I'm passionate about Georgian architecture. And the day I saw this property, I thought, we've got to have it. We can move the workshop into part of it. I can live in part of it. I think for all the folks who work with us here, this is a magical place. And the building to me breathes and oozes um, just art and love. The main aim is to be what we always wanted to be, which is the best price, the best service, the best customer service, um, with the best product and keep expanding like we are. Simi, like I say, joined the, the company and she's taken it that extra ste step because We'll get some of the top artists of the world, we'll bring them here. They can actually experience our love of art. And we hope when they leave that they get a little bit of us to take away with them. Because I really believe we have created something special here and we're ready now to take it to the next level. What did I tell you guys? Wasn't that a great video? Oh my gosh. And, and you know, you got, you got Rosemary and see Rosemary's so cute. You just gotta love her. Uh, man, I'll tell you what, this is going to be such a great time. So with that said, I am going to bring her on right now. There she is. She's almost here. Let's see. I'll take my solo off. There you are. Hello. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. Yeah, we had that was wasn't that a great video. Who made that video? That was a great video. I loved it. Yeah, we've got um, we've got our two in-house guys doing it, and then we have a guy that we work with a lot now called Joe Hawkins, who does all of our videos. Just amazing. Makes us it makes it look like a movie. <laughs> it really does. It really does. A very very high quality uh, production. It really looks gorgeous. Thank you. Oh my gosh, that property! Wow, we're going to be talking about that for sure. Oh my, so that that is going to be the most beautiful building and land. Wow, it's just gorgeous. And I live in Panama City Beach, Florida, the Lord's most beautiful beaches. And I saw that land, and I was like, oh. <laughs> yeah. England, um, the phrase is if you live in Yorkshire it's God's own country um, and it it's, is, it's, true. <laughs> it's, true. it's absolutely beautiful where, we, where we're based yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. Max. you gotta put Max on the screen guys Max is the cutest dog oh my gosh we see Max I hope she brings him on is she bringing Max on let's see there he is there he I'm is back. Barking. I put him outside. <laughs> I told you. I, she, it, when you guys, you guys got to go on on Simi's uh, social media, on on her Instagram and her Facebook and all that. She's got so many videos and pictures of that crazy dog. Oh my god, that dog is. Not expected. 
<laughs> That's okay. I was, telling him about, I was telling him about how famous your dog is on your social media. And you know what I love most about your dog? Mm. That dog loves mud. So mud. Loves I mean. That, that is a fresh dog right now. Um, he doesn't usually look that fluffy. Um, but he's he loves mud. And I'm so sorry he barked like that. He's oh, no, no, no. That's awesome. That's awesome. You know, uh, my dog is normally right behind me, but I told him he had to go because he was just, he likes to take baths and he cleans himself and the sound, God bless him. The sound oh, is just- I know housekeeping is so loud in this house. It's ridiculous. And it's all yeah. from him. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Well, it's good to have, good to have a good, good canine, companion, you know, so he's, he's almost as famous as you are. So. Well, he probably more so. Everybody loves Max. How can you not? You know, when like I said, when you see him in that mud, I'm just like, like you're trying to take him for a walk, and he's like mud puddle, kaboom, rolling around in it, and all this, and, and he's such a fluffy, light colored dog that when he's covered in mud, it's like hilarious. So I know it's he, the first thing he does when he, when we go for a walk, straight for the mud. There's, there's nothing I can do to stop him from going straight for the mud. <laughs> I give up. I give up trying. No point. Yeah. Oh man, yeah, sounds like me as a little boy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's great. You know, one of the things I was when I was watching the video, your mom had mentioned that she used to tie flies for fly fishing for her brother. Yeah. And, yeah. and you know, when I was a kid, um, my my father tied flies, and, and he did it as he started doing it because he quit smoking and he was needing a hobby. He needed something for his hands and stuff. So he started tying flies. My dad is an avid fisherman. I mean, he is like right. crazy fisherman. Um, I always joke with my students about how redneck I actually am and they don't believe me because I'm a Yankee from, from New England. And I tell them, I, I take them to the family, uh, like my, my cousin's website, which is shootamoose.com. And that, oh, that gives you, and that's like no joke, shootaboost.com. I'm like, that's my cousin, that's my uncle, that's my other uncle, that's my dad, that's my, you know. And they're all in camo standing there next to a moose, you know. It's like, yeah, you know? Brilliant. So my dad got into fly fishing, and I would sit, and I remember being just a little boy, and he would, he had a bench, and he had his little kit, and he'd sit there and he would, you know, just twine over the fish hook, and he would make these beautiful, beautiful flies. And I would sit on a bench wow. next to him and just, just enraptured watching them make them. But they're pieces of art. And do you know the amount of painters that I now know that say, oh, I, I do a bit of fish fly tie-in, you know? And, and the, it's it's a, a long lost, beautiful thing to do. And it's so lovely that some people still do it, but a lot of people come forward and say, oh, I used to, you know? So, oh, yeah. but that, that's how it all started. Um, Isn't that amazing? Which, yeah, well it, well, it's such an intricate thing, you see, so. The, the intricacy anybody who does fly ties will know it, it's it really you know it's a patience game and it's it's the same with making brushes so right you know uh, yeah. just watching her you know you know cutting everything and, and laying it in and putting it in the ferrule and measuring it out it was just it, it, it's you know you I, I you know it's like i look at that and i'm like i could watch her do that all day long yeah well do you know it, it's funny because we always say in business, there's so many things that take up your time and that, that oh. pull you down. But it, making brushes shoots you right back up. It's it's weird. It's such a therapeutic um, little hobby to have. It started out as a hobby, you know. And my mum, that's why she makes brushes on the evenings um, as well, um, because she it's it's really quite therapeutic. Um, right, I can see and, that. You know. So some so some moms knit. Your mom makes paint brushes. Yeah, she's, no, yeah, that is really, really great. That is so cool. So that, I mean, that, I love it. I love, you know, um, it, it reminds me of, uh, there's actually a, a passage of the Bible that says, don't, don't frown upon humble beginnings because the Lord delights in watching the work begin. And that's kind of what it reminds me of, you know, start off with this hobby. Your, your uncle says, hey, you know, you, you make flies for me, you make a paintbrush for you, you know, yeah. and all of a sudden, light bulb moment, she starts making it. And now you guys are, you know, one of the top paintbrush companies out there, you know, and all of the top artists in the country, they swear by your brushes. I mean, when I, and guys, let me tell you something out there in internet land. When I say that some of the top artists 
in the world swear by these brushes right here they actually do <laughs> they really really do that's how i heard about you was the artists that i admired and the artists that i were looking up to every time they were doing a demo they were holding up rosemary company brushes and they were saying it's the only ones i use these are the only ones i ever want to use i used to use others now I use them. and they would just talk about the quality of the craftsmanship and how the how they worked and how they you know they were game changers for them mm. and so when you hear that you're like okay i need to try that and i can say from experience absolutely absolutely bless you because honestly um our entire game in this is it, it, there isn't a plan the plan was um just meet the customers um be authentic um bring them in and um offer them the product that we know we can make and the rest of it they've done for us so many of our painters um you know th there is no hookup deal it's it's not about that it's it's a genuine thing and and honestly i gotta tell you we feel so blessed for that really i mean money can't buy that it, it just exactly. can't yeah you, before before we went on the air and my viewers have heard me say this before relationships are the highest form of currency and the relationship that you develop with artists yeah is way more valuable than the selling of the paintbrushes because they end it up is. you know they end up becoming your sales force really in a lot of ways because they're telling everybody they know this is what i use you know and it's like when you go to workshops and you go to you know when i'm teaching a workshop or i'm teaching a class my students always want to know well, what do you paint with Mm -hmm. What kind of paint do you use? What kind of brushes do you use? Do you use this? Do you use that solvent? Do you use this? Do you, you know, blah, 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 blah. And when you tell them, I use these brushes, then all of a sudden they're like, I got to have those brushes. Or they want to know why you use that brush, you know? And it makes a big difference. So you develop this beautiful relationship with, with the artists out there in every genre possible. And then they become this, the, the, this giant marketing tool for you in a lot of ways. Have the, the the reach honestly is is far bigger than what mum and I ever thought it would be. You know, we, we knew that people would recommend if they enjoyed, but we never realized that rosemary brushes would be a bit of a religion almost for some <laughs> folks. They, just, they swear by our brushes. And then yeah, it was explaining. You know, it, it, it's kind of like when you first make that jump from the inexpensive paints to a professional grade paint, it's, it's a game changer. It's a game changer. And when you go from brushes that you got at a box store and you can get some good brushes in a box store, but when you go from that to a handmade piece of craftsmanship of that quality and you start working with it, you think, Oh, it's just, it's just a bunch of bristles, but it's not the way that it's put together, the way it's created makes a massive difference. I've got a great analogy for you, Tim. And I, I say this when, because one of the things that um, mum and I have done to try and um, build up um, a force that understands is probably the best way of saying it, um, is we do brush making demonstrations. So we'll take a team or a group of 30 people or 40 people and we'll make brushes for them intricately for a couple of hours so they can really get inside of our heads as to how we make it and the thought process into that. Um, and one of the things that um, I, I say as an analogy for folks is it's like a good coffee. So you get a Starbucks, okay, they hand you the mug. If you make a coffee at home, you pick your own beans, you grind them how you want them ground, you, you leave it in the pot for as long as you want, you pour it, you pour the milk in or the cream or whatever you're having with it and, it, and, and the layers in its constant layers like this. And that coffee, when you come to pour it, is to your spec, it's perfect. Now, gone are the days where mom and I can, we still do slightly, but not as much as we used to, make specific brushes for customers. Mm -hmm. um, we have our 3,000 ranges, so that kind of does the talking for us. Um, I, I want to pass out when I say that because it's a lot of work. <laughs> but bet. the thing being, though, that they're all made to our spec, our standard. And the standard, this was the biggest thing for Mum and I, 
that standard, no matter how big we got, couldn't slip. It couldn't change. Right. Um, so the budget we got from us 10 years ago or, you know, when my mum and dad ran a company together 30 years ago making brushes are still the same as what we put out now, even though now we'll make 400 of that brush, right. not 25, you know. So it, it's a real um, quality control thing to ensure that the packets leave perfectly, um, regardless of if we've got, you know, 50 packets going out or 200 packets that day. Actually, on Monday, this Monday just gone was our busiest day we've had ever, busier wow. than Christmas. And we shipped out. Can you guess how many packets we shipped out on Monday? God, I, I, I can't even fathom. I can't even fathom. So tell us, tell us. 449 packets. Oh, my. In one day. In one day. Of in one day. Made brushes. That the handmade brushes. They, they were all made for the orders, obviously. So the orders come in the weekend. Um, but we've got a huge stock room. And honestly, our packers and our pickers picked 449 and they left the workshop. So it's just, honestly, it's a year since I did that video with mom. Mm -hmm. um, and in that video, I said we ship at a good day's 180 to 250. We're now on 450. I mean, your brain. It just wants to explode, you know. Right, right. Wow. So when you started, it was just, it was just mom, dad, and you guys. Yeah. And then now, right. how many employees do you have total now? Would you say thirty-four, including the brush makers? Wow. So, so how many? We've got twenty in half. Wow. So how so, many brush makers do you have? Uh, Sixteen. And that's got to be a job that takes a long time to master. It does. It does. But it's, it's, um, Are we all first, high tires or? It, well, it's not easy because you can't, in the UK, I don't know if it's the same in America, but for discrimination, you can't put, um, must have good eyesight or must have, um, nimble fingers. You have to be very open with how you invite people for an interview. Okay. So we have to put things like, uh, would be useful if you had hobbies such as knitting or sewing for the intricacy. Because oh. there's no point in it and, and trying to get a job with us if you if you openly know you've got poor eyesight, for example, you right. know. So, so here's the thing. You then try and find brush makers. You bring them on. It takes... It takes two years from the from the minute that they walk through the door till the second year anniversary with us to be able to say you can make Kalinsky sable now. That's how long of a, of a position. So you start a brush maker off on hog bristle, mm -hmm. um, and then you move up to synthetics, and then from there, then they go on to the natural hair, and, and Kalinsky sable's the top because weight for weight, Kalinsky sable's three and a half times the price of gold. So wow. you've got to. You've got a brush this sort of size. By the way, I have to a confession. I was in work this morning. And I was picking, and I brought this home with me in my pocket. So I don't actually <laughs> have any brushes in the house. That's my rule. My house is no brushes, but I had this. Anyway, but the reason I want to show you was because if, if you look at that brush, now that brush there would probably retail at about six or seven pounds, eight dollars, something like that. Mm -hmm. But wait, wait, that's three and a half times the price of what gold would weigh. Wow. The brush maker doesn't want to learn on that because there's too much pressure. Right, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, if bristle, okay, it would cost a tenth of that. So it's not right. so, you know, the pressure's not on as much to think I've got to do 250 of these. So that's amazing. That's amazing. So let's, that, that's a great way to transition to talking about the different kinds of of brushes that are out there, you know, when, you know, when you're new to art and mm -hmm. my goodness, there are people that have been painting for decades and they just use, you know, a lot of times they just go to the store, they buy paintbrush packs, they don't think. And then you go to like the art store and there's just shelves of paintbrushes and you're like, and they, and they separate them. These are watercolor brushes. These are this kind of brush. These yeah. are oil brushes. These are acrylic brushes. Uh, these, and then some of them get really confusing because they go, these are for watercolor and acrylic, or these are for oils and acrylic. And some of them even say watercolor, acrylic, or oils. Mm -hmm. And you see all that stuff. And then there's synthetic and hog hair and synthetic hog hair. And you're like, it Whoa. just 
your brain melts. And if you don't know what you're talking about, so let, let's start by just talking about bristles, you know, natural bristles versus synthetics and everything in between. Like, what's the difference and why? on those and then we'll go into the different types of brushes and I'll really and in between that what makes a good brush. Okay, there's a million questions so let's do one at a yeah. time. Yeah, so we'll do the first one um, which is let's talk about the different bristles and what they mean. Okay, so first point to point out to folks is the word bristle actually is confusing because I know you mean the fibers in the end of the brush. But bristle is also a type of brush. In other words, hog hair, okay, which is pig. Um, Tim, can I still hear you even though I'm- Yes, yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Keep pointing me into it if you need, if I've gone off topic, because that's that no problem. Can't. Okay, so you've got the, the, the easiest way to look at brushes is think you've got synthetic or you've got natural hair. Um, and that's for a number of reasons. For the use of the brush, um, and mainly for how you would then clean it afterwards. It is important and, and really useful to look at them in two sections, okay? So if we look at synthetics, just fully, fully synthetics for a minute, and then we break it down into oil, acrylic, and watercolor, yeah? So for acrylic, this is a really easy one. Don't buy natural hair brushes, buy synthetics. Yeah. Um, the reason is, yeah, the reason is because acrylic kills brushes. That's great for brush makers, but it's terrible for your back pocket uh, because it's a glue. It's um, it's a glue. It, they kill brushes. Um, they're more difficult to clean. Um, they dry super quick. The paint dries so quick in the ends of the hairs, as you'll all know, probably anyone who uses acrylic is constantly going into water. So therefore, eliminate your issues and go with synthetics. Um, for oils, synthetics are fantastic for um, laying on the back of your painting, blocking in. Um, some folks enjoy synthetics then for the refinement of the paintings. Um, and that's where we'll talk about in a minute the different levels of synthetic. But it's important to know that as a general rule for oils, um, they're really great for, for blocking in, which is why a lot of plain air painters love synthetics because they haven't got time to refine. Um, and then I would say in oils where you want to refine, folks often then go to natural hair, but like I said, we'll talk about the synthetic alternatives. Um, for watercolour, it really is a money thing. Um, it's a little different for oil and acrylic, like I said, but for, for watercolour, um, buy the best you can afford. Now, that doesn't mean to say you've got synthetic, a mix, and then pure hair. That doesn't mean to say that synthetics aren't good. Um, they're certainly, some people prefer them, but they're certainly a way to get you started in watercolor. Um, you don't have to fear looking at Kalinsky Sable, for example, and think, I can't afford this hobby. I can't afford to do this because that brush is 50 bucks. It's, you know, that's not what this is about. So definitely look at synthetics as your entry. But then you've got the nice bridge, which you don't have for oil and acrylic. So you've got the synthetic and the Kalinsky Sable, which is your Rolls Royce. But the in-between is the red Sable blend, which is 50% synthetic and 50% Sable. So you've got the synthetic in there that pulls the price down, but you've got the Sable in there that pulls the standard of the brush up. Does that make sense, Tim? That does, and it's interesting. Okay. It's really interesting to note that you can um, that that you can blend them. Yes. Yeah. You know, yeah. You can blend that, them. That, that's surprising. You know, that's actually you know new information for me. I didn't know that you blended um, synthetic with natural hair. That's and the idea of then you've got the best of both worlds. See, for, we're just talking watercolorists here, but they really have the best of both worlds because you've got the golden synthetic, like I say, and I keep saying it over because I think the more we say it, the more we remember. So you've got the golden synthetic at entry level, the red sable blend, which is your halfway house. It's the best of both worlds. Pulls the price down, but you've also got the sable in there. So you are going to get the qualities that a sable brush would give to some extent. Now, right. It's really only time and impatience, perhaps, and also skill level that would say to you, I now need to invest in Kalinsky Sable. 
And at that point, then you go in its Kalinsky Sable level. Okay. Um, so that's that's the most useful thing to say about um, watercolor. You know. Okay. Now you you mentioned Kalinsky, you know, hairs a lot. Um, a lot of people don't know what exactly that is, and you say it's, it costs more than gold, which you know that's that's cool because yeah, you know me, I like to paint over gold leaf, so anything gold related makes me excited. Yeah. But, so why? What is it about that hair that makes it so expensive? What is it? Uh, it's mink, Kalinsky sable. It's Mustela Siberia, which we get from Russia and a couple of other places, Tibet being one of them. Um, the, the, I think the most important thing for people to know as a brush maker is um, we can only use the tail of the animal. We can't use the pelts, we can't use any other part of the animal, only the tail. Now the animals are killed for their fur and for their meat. They're not killed for the brush making industry. Um, if they were, it would have been shut down a long time ago. So what we, what we can say legitimately is they're a byproduct. The tails would have either been burnt or they get thrown away. And I've seen piles of them to know that they would just discard them. Right. Uh, why it's so expensive is because of the demand for them. Um, and there isn't the animals out there. Um, it's such a fine grade hair. It really is. I mean, you only have to honestly close your eyes and pick up a Klinsky Sable brush and just do some, some swooping marks. And the brush talks for you. It, it's... But the other good thing for watercolorists to know is, unlike, unfortunately, oil and acrylic artists, you can get away with a few brushes and make them really good ones. You don't have to have 50 brushes for watercolor. If you have, we, we make a brush called the Roger Jones brush, which is a pointed round and it's got a longer tip, okay? And it's um, like a tapered point. Mm -hmm. Roger is a fabulous, really world-class watercolorist. He swears by that one brush for any painting he does because he can do huge washes right the way through to, he does a lot of illustration, right the way through to the finest point. And it's important to know that in watercolor, you don't need to, to spend all that money. Um, just invest invest in a few really good tools. Right, and, and that's the thing, you know, when you buy a really quality product, mm. when you buy a higher end uh, art product, they tend to last a lot longer and yeah. they work better. So you're getting a double benefit. You're getting something that is, yeah, it costs more, but you, but that one brush might outlast five cheaper brushes. Tim, we say the same with good leather shoes, you know, invest in your shoes and you can walk from out. Buy yeah. shoes and you know, by the end of your trip, you're going to have to get new ones. Oh, and by the way, you're walking back barefoot. You know, that's, that's yeah. the kind of analogy you're looking at. And, and that really is, you know, and, and so it's like, you know, spend the money, you're actually saving money. And, no, and that's I, think, realize. I think definitely um, something people realize when they meet me in person at shows, um, I don't think people perhaps think too much about it then when they go on the website because they've probably already got an idea of us. But I think people presume homemade or handmade means expensive. And I've got to tell you, we are, it's different for us. We, we don't really sell to shops. We have a couple of distributors here and there, but we don't have that middleman. So where Mum and I have, have, have sat our place in this big world is to deal direct with our customers. Right. So we are 50 to 60% cheaper than the shops. But yeah. we're having it. Oh, absolutely. Now, I mean, I've gone to big box stores, and I'm like, this brush that I'm looking at is obviously way lower quality than yours, and it costs more. Yeah, yeah. Um, that, that doesn't make any sense. I, I, why would I buy this when I can just order? Well, again, another good analogy would be look at food. If you knew there was a homemade burger, you know, there was a butcher that's that's cook, you know, catch it, kill it, eat it type type thing. If you know that it's pure, you know, grass fed and it's organic and but it's still a damn good burger versus one that you just buy off the shelf. But they're the same price. If not, that one from the shelf is a bit more expensive. To me, it's a no-brainer, but it, it's it's often it's the case to just try and let folks know we are not more expensive than our competitors. In fact, we are usually cheaper. Um, Less expensive, yeah. You know, and that's a big statement, by the way. I know. Yeah, it that really is. It really is. You know, and that's the thing. You know, it's like I remember years ago. This is years ago. 
Um, we're talking 20 years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. I had you do not look old enough to be referred to 20 years ago, by the way. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. <laughs> but um, I, were, I had an ad agency, and one of my customers was a window manufacturer. Mm -hmm. And they made windows for hurricanes, you know, windows that were strong enough to withstand a hurricane. Mm -hmm. And uh, their model was built on the coast for the coast. Mm -hmm. And they were not the most expensive window out there by far. But they made a window that was so strong that it ended up being like the first window that would be allowed on high. It, these were vinyl plastic windows. The first that ever to be on a high rise on the beach. Uh, it was so strong that the army certified it for anti-terrorism bombs, bomb mm -hmm. protection. It was that strong. But the window was significantly less expensive than their competitors. And it was 10 times stronger. Right. So yeah. it was like, Sometimes the best doesn't necessarily mean the most expensive. That's though where the marketing tool of word of mouth comes in. Because at that point, yeah. there's only so much I can say to folks to say, hop on board, join us, put an order in, we'll help you. You know, Actually, at that point you go, right, keep doing that. But if you provide a, a quality product, exactly what I said in that video, quality product, the right price, yeah. the right service, yeah. It for itself. And that's, that's what happens. It's, it's exactly. Good. Exactly. Every artist that I know that I admire and that I go, wow. And you know, like I want my career to be like that, you know, mm -hmm. that those, those artists, when I go to uh, the portrait society of America, when I go to plein air South, when I go to these, uh, when I go to these conferences and you see these world-class artists, they are your sales team in a lot of ways because they're swearing again by your brushes. So, uh, that that was the real reason I wanted you on. It's like, who else would you want on when we're talking about brushes? I want you guys because all the top artists in the world not only use your brushes, but they swear by them. So that's that's really it. That's your sales team, you know, and it's amazing. So we talked about the bristles and the brushes. So let's talk about what if when when I'm going to get a brush, like here I got I got Filbert here, um, and this is your Filbert Evergreen, at the, and we're going to talk about about your different brands, different um, uh, types of brushes that you make. But um, what are the qualities of a good paintbrush that, that, that as an artist I'm looking for? What are the qualities and the attributes that make a good brush versus just an average brush or a bad brush? Well, I'll tell you, the first thing I'd say is how it feels. Um, it, and, and I want everybody to know, Tim and I haven't practiced these questions. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's more organic. Tim asks me on the spot, you know, so I haven't had hours to think this up. So what I would say is, honestly, it, it, picking up a brush, the, the weight and the distribution is important mm -hmm. because really it's the extension of your arm. Um, that being said, that's slightly hypocritical for a mail order company to be saying that to folks that can't physically go out and see our brushes in the stores. Right, feel it. <laughs> yeah, so what I'd say then is if you go to a painting class or if your teacher uses our brushes, ask them if you can hold them. Hold mm -hmm. them. And even if you just mix some of the paint on their palette or your palette, you don't need to be working on your own painting with them, but I think you'll immediately feel some sort of difference just from how they feel on, on the first feel of the handle to the distribution yeah. plate. <clears throat> that would be my first thing. I yeah, think, you can definitely um, tell, you know, when you're playing with your brush, you know, the balance, yeah. the, the feel, the, you know, everything. I like to twirl them around my hand like I'm a drummer, you know, feel it. Uh -huh. you know, that, and, and you can tell. Yeah, I think I think the, um, the next thing I'd say you're really looking for is how they hold the shape. So when you fully immerse them in the water, if it's watercolor or if it's acrylic or oil, and you've snapped all the gum arabic off and you get them in that paint how do they feel how do they handle the paint um and and really a good brush should hold its shape um you know we all know the phrase or maybe we don't so i'll say it but you should be able to i'm so glad i brought this home now with me um <laughs> you flick a brush like this and it should it should give off the perfect point as soon as you flick it you know and that's that's a good brush um some brushes you have to kind of manipulate back into shape not so good unless it's squirrel hair which is really soft um but yeah i would i would say it's how they then handle the paint um, and I think the third thing to tie that up really is then how they clean. 
Um, because as much as it's great to have a new brush, I mean, I, I know I, I paint plain air, but it, it, as much as it's great to get a, a brush, uh, fill it full of paint and, and get going with it, after that session, if it doesn't last a second session or a tenth session, you've got an issue on your hands, you know, and it, it, and it was an expensive painting session. So I, I think really then how they clean has to then come as like your third point, you know. Right, right. And that, and that, and that's, the, you know, the, we, you know, I've actually done videos on how to clean your brushes because so many people don't even do that right. Tim, do you know what? I'm thrilled that you have because I hate talking about it. So keep doing yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, it, it's kind of funny. It's like I do a lot of a lot of boring videos sometimes, but it's it they're they're important. You know, I mean, I remember when I was when I was at the, the Academy of Art University, uh, which is out of San Francisco. One of the first classes that they made us take was how to clean your brushes. Was, and that, it, was that with Craig Nelson? Yes, it, Craig Nelson. Huh. I want to interview him so bad. He hasn't returned my call yet, so. so I love him. Do you know what? Oh Same my God. And he was him. like my first like art hero because you know he was the he was the dean of, of the school. He's and good. He was so good, isn't he? I love him to death. I love them. Yeah. I, went to see them. I went and did a brush demonstration there. Yeah, so hit the first video was him, 45 minutes yeah. how to clean your brushes. And he took, I mean, he purposely had brushes that he left oil paint in them and let it dry. Yeah. Oil brushes were hard as a rock. You could hammer a nail in a wood with them. That's yeah. How hard they were. And he brought that brush back to flawless by cleaning it the proper way and all this. And that just was instilled in me, you know, proper carry yeah. brushes, especially with acrylics. My gosh, if you're not cleaning your brushes properly with acrylic, Never you, you call it a glue, and it is, but it's 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 a it's a plastic polymer. It's plastic. So if you don't clean your paintbrush perfectly, flawlessly, your brush bristles are gonna turn into plastic. I got one tip for you though. If you ever leave your paints, whether that's oil or acrylic, fully in your brushes. It's called, uh, here we go, um, not da, 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 Turpinoid Natural. Yes. Do yep. you know the stuff? Mm hmm Yeah. We've been in that for 24 hours. It looks disgusting, but my gosh, do they come up clean. Yeah, it, it really yeah. will clean up the brush. Yeah, they, you know, it's like when you're cleaning your brush, especially if you do that, yeah, there, there's got to be some things – you know, you can do terpenoid is, is some powerful stuff. I mean, it's, it's, um, you know, and there's a lot of artists that go solvent free and they don't use anything but linseed oil to clean their brushes. Yeah. Uh, but you still, you know, every now and then I will go back and I will still, I'll give my brushes a good washing. Um, even though they're clean, I like to put them in, especially with the natural hair ones, you know, give them a good, good soap and water clean, gentle soap and water clean. And then I put hair conditioner in it just to give it that healthiness. And then it kind of does that. Now, what do you feel about that? Is that a no, no, or is that a. No, I, it's a, a hundred percent thumbs up to me. I think if you're prepared to put it on, this is what I always say to customers. If you're prepared to put um, whatever you're prepared to put on your own hair is fine for a brush. And by that, I mean, we're putting harmful substances on the ends of these sticks, okay? They're only going to last so long. Um, right. I will say thank goodness because that's how we stay in business. But <laughs> genuinely, you know, you've got to keep care for them. And, and one of the biggest tips is um, get a rolling board tray or jam jar lid if you're watercolour. Just fill it full of old conditioner, whatever you've got in the house. And leave your brushes in there for an hour to two hours this weekend. And I guarantee you, if you wash it out, your brushes will feel like new at the end of them. They just yeah. will. They'll revive yeah. them. And that's what I do. Whenever whenever I know I'm not going to be painting for a while, mm -hmm. um, my, my paintings, they're a conglomerate. It's acrylics and oils together. Mm -hmm. So I paint the, the bottom layers in acrylic, and then I do the figure in oils. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so... I don't oil paint as much because I try to do a bunch of paintings at a time because the process, you know, I gild and then I go over that and then I put text and all that. And that's all done in acrylic. So by the time I, and I try to do all of that at once on like five paintings. Right. And then, cause there's so much curing time that, that has to be done between yeah. the layers of acrylic. I try to let it go 24 hours between each layer. So I don't oil paint as often. So right. I clean those oil paint brushes put them in the conditioner and put them up 
and they'll get hard as a rock. Yeah. Just swish them in water, boom, they're back and they're brand new and, and, and they look good. So whenever I'm not going to be painting for a while with my oil painting brushes, that's what I do. And it just yeah. keeps them alive, keeps them good. But I want to show something um, real quick uh, to the viewers to, to, to prove to them just how amazingly strong and durable and amazing your brushes are. I actually did a video that's on your YouTube channel. It about, is. Um, for those of you that don't know, uh, one of the things that I, uh, that I do is I'm known as the fire painter. And I do performance art. You know, you see those people that they paint like a big giant painting in like two minutes to music and all that. And some people will paint upside down, they'll flip it up and it'll be like a famous person or they'll do that. Um, my shtick is while I'm painting, my paintbrushes are on fire. I literally light them on fire. So I'm like those, um, those guys in Hawaii that spin the fire, you know, the sticks like that. And uh, that's actually where I got the idea. And, um, and I also breathe fire while I'm doing that. I can spit a 15 foot flame, which I don't want to brag, but that's pretty good. That's that pretty, really good. pretty impressive. <laughs> really, you said that you were past it. I think that's amazing. <laughs> you know, it, it's kind of funny. You know, my, my best time to do it, because when I go, usually when I go to like a, a host organization will have me come. One of the things I like to do is I like to say, hey, bring me uh, like a couple days earlier um, so that on Friday we can go to a local school and I'll paint their school mascot. And, awesome. and and usually, like, I don't know what it's like in the UK, but, you know, in, in, in America here, they'll put the kids and they'll just sit them on the floor because usually the stage area is in the cafeteria. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, so they just sit these kids, and I've got pre-K, kindergarten, first, second, third grade, and fourth yeah. grade, and they put the little ones, the really tiny ones, in the front. Yeah, it's similar. And I'm breathing a 10 foot flame literally right over these kids' heads. And they're like, <gasps> and then they scream and cheer. And, you know, some, some schools get so excited, they make fan posters for me. You know, they draw fire. Oh, it's the best in the world. But so I was using small, cheap brushes, uh, acrylic, you know, uh, synthetic tacon brushes, you know, is what I was using to paint. And obviously these paintbrushes don't last long because they're on fire. <laughs> right. so, but the brushes are only- you know, When I first met you, by the way, do you yeah. know you're great for being on fire? And I was like, I have never been asked that one before. <laughs> yeah, that's true, that's true. So, um, but I was painting with a normal size brush, a brush like this, you know, a normal, typical brush. I'm gonna full screen you so people can see this. Here we go. So a, a typical brush like this, normal size. So I'm here and there's a wad of cloth here that makes a flame about that big, you know, a huge like ball of fire that big. So I'm painting and I will paint. I'll be like this with two hands. So I, you paint with two hands and I'm holding my brushes and I'm painting and I would have to every now and then go, go like this with my arms because the flame would grow and burn my fingers. So I went to a conference and I found these brushes. Watch this, you ready to see this brush? Watch the handle. Look at that, now there's there's tape on the end, that's how I hold on to it, because I, I swing these things around me like a ninja in action, that's what I do. And because the fire, it's cool, I'm spinning around my head and behind my back and all this. And so I put a lot of tape there so I can, it, it, it doesn't, slip out of my hand and go flying into the audience because that could happen. <laughs> Launching into the audience. But I found these brushes. They're, they're, they're now measuring from the tip to the tip. It's 27 inches, but the actual wooden part's only 24. But I saw these and I went, well, if I put the fire here, my hands way back here. Plus I can swing them more like, you know, like a ninja. Cause you know, I, I may be a Frenchman, but I'm a French ninja, so, <laughs> and I'm swinging them around. So I got these brushes and normally on a normal, typical Taquan brush, you use them once, you got to throw them away because the flame would literally melt the plastic Taquan synthetic brush. It would melt the bristles. They're done, they're fused forever. So I got these, and this is a literal one that's been through the fire. And I'm gonna zoom in, I'm gonna bring it as amazing. So you got you can see if you look, there's bubbles from the burnt here. Um, 
the burnt uh, way that it's, it's held on with a fire retardant tape and it's completely covered in bubbles in this area where it's melted and it's melted here. You can see all the soot on it. You know, I mean, it's, it's on there. Um, By the way, we're not these are, I got two of them. These are the ones I use. Now you can see they're a little bent and beat up. I painted with these five times and look at the bristles and you can even hear it. If you listen carefully, they still have a snap to them and they're still able to bend. Now, that's insane. Like I said, I painted with these multiple times because I couldn't. And the first time I burnt, the bristles were perfect. This is like five or six times here, uh, fire painting. And when I say I'm fire, I'm, these things are on fire for about three to five minutes. Just huge ball of fire. And um, they survived. I mean, look at that. That is so cool. So my point, I guess, in all of this is, you know, it, oh, look, you got Max there too. I love it. Hey, Max a million. Look at that face. He was crying a little bit. So I just oh, poor guy. But, um, you know, my thing is, is this shows the quality of your brushes because it's nobody amazing. is going to do this to their brush. Right. It's you amazing. Know? Honestly, it's amazing that you've set them on fire use them five times and then, you know, you still use them. I can actually paint something with them. You know, yeah. there's paint on them. I'm literally painting while they're on fire. And yeah. so. Well, um, actually that, that reminds me that we've got, we'll have to um, post Tim in the reviews afterwards, uh, uh, the, the video of you painting with them. It's such a cool thing to see. It, it's pretty fun. I enjoy it. It's uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's credit to you because you can turn your hand to that and then your regular painting job, you know, and it's, it's just, it is so fun. You're right. It's, I think it's brilliant. It is. You know, I, you know, for me, it's like, I like to do things that introduce people to art. You know, people that would never normally even think about art. They see me do the fire painting and they're like, it, it's like an intro to art for the, a lot of people. Yeah, of they're, like, they're like, I never thought, you know, and, and you know, a lot of places that I go are, you know, our churches and, and places like that. 90% of where I perform is in, is in, is in churches. Um, although I do do a lot of civic events. I did like, um, I did a New Year's Eve ball drop event, you know, things like that. But most of the people, they're like, man, I never seen nobody paint with fire before, you know, you know, and all this, you know, that's the typical guy that yeah. is watching me paint, you know, they're yeah, just yeah. no cute public and redneck and all this. And they're like, and all of a sudden they think art's cool, you know, so that's, <laughs> Honestly, Mum and I say this all the time. You've got to get people going somewhere. We've got to start them going somewhere. So who cares how it is? You know, if that's uh, you're paid by numbers local group, which credit to them. You know, Mum and I actually even say about Bob Ross. At the end of the day, Bob Ross has got so many people painting, which is phenomenal. Yeah. You know? Yes. You know, it's funny. It's like when people are, people will. I've heard people say, "Oh, he was a sellout. He wasn't that good." Blah 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 blah. blah. I'm like, you know what? More people were interested in art because of that man totally. than all the gallery artists combined. <laughs> you I know? totally agree. Totally yeah. agree, honestly. Yeah. It was the same thing with like paint parties. You know, um, I used to teach paint parties for yeah, you know, paint parties. And, and okay. those, you know, the art museum that we did them in at the height of the paint party industry, we were having a slow night was 65 people. Yeah, that's amazing. You know, I had one time we had 111 students taking the paint party class and we were doing that six days a week like that for, for five, six years. And more people walked into that art gallery in one week than normally would in a year. Yeah. yeah. And they had to walk past all the beautiful art in the art gallery. But yeah. These were people who would have never set foot in an art gallery now they're now they're all like, wow! I didn't know this was here. Oh, you know, I'm going to bring kids. I'm going to, and they're now. Oh. It's a similar thing in the UK at the moment. There's this big trend of um, folks doing, you know, like bachelorette parties, hen parties, mm -hmm. like that, um, yeah. where where they then do like new drawings or whatever they might do. Um, uh -huh. And you just think, well, do you know what? As much as it's a joke at the time for people, some people might actually really enjoy that, and afterwards think, oh. Do you know, I, I've enjoyed that. It, that was kind of therapeutic. <clears throat> you know, I I, um, I felt like I could switch off 
and, and you never know they might then just pick up a brush or or a, or a pencil and think that's my new hobby so it really is i can't tell you how many times i've bumped into people inside like a hobby lobby or a michael's store and they grab me and they're like tim i i know i've been doing your paint parties for so long what do i what do i buy i yeah. want to start at home and they don't know what to do and i'm like okay let's do this let's buy this buy this buy this and, and here you go and a lot of my my private art students or my art students in my college classes they used to be paint party students yeah and they just got hooked and now they're doing this so art is you know that's what i love about art art brings people together it, it people have that light bulb moment and they do it and so that that's really cool um so let's get back to um one last thing i want to ask you about brushes before we go because this is one that, that definitely gets people confused this is around mm -hmm. got a got a flat mm -hmm. got a filbert yeah you know there's fan brushes there's riggers there's what the heck is the difference <laughs> and what do they do because like me i i paint primarily with this like i paint almost the entire painting with different sizes of these I know some artists that will only paint with these. Mm -hmm. You know, um, some people. Now, I I do love a filbert. Filberts are fun, mm -hmm. but I just because because they're fancy, and I like them. You know, but they all do a different thing. So you know, to a new artist trying to figure out what are all these brushes, can you talk to us a little bit about what's the difference and why and why they're important? Yeah, of course. I think. Um my, my first piece of advice is use what you like. Don't worry about what anyone else is using. Use what you like. But that follows closely to the next point, which is use what you've seen other people use and you, you like what they do. So example, Tim, would be your students. It would make sense for them to follow you in what brushes you're using. Mm -hmm. If they want to get the same marks and the same sort of strokes and the textures and so so follow your teacher if you can but not if you want to express yourself don't the, the, there's a fine line between saying i want the same brush as tim uses and i want to paint identical to tim actually no you don't want to be a mini tim you want to become your own style your own painter so at that point i'd say yes granted tim will help you get going and he'll definitely give you a feel for what you like but at that point, then, if you do prefer the filberts over the flats, then use them. You know, that's right. the honest answer there. What I would say is um, there are lots of different shapes. There's obviously millions of sizes, too, and there's different handle lengths and things. The, the generic overall view is short handle tend to be for watercolour, long handle tend to be for oil and acrylic because oil and acrylic artists are encouraged to stand back for perspective. Waterfall, mm -hmm. you're working over your work like right. so. Yeah, so the last thing you want is a brush longer than that to poke you in the eye. Mm -hmm. Yes, Max, I've seen that you've got your ball. Sorry. <laughs> um, you, you, I, you know, if you could bring Max to plein air south here in, in, oh, in can Florida. You like to oh, get we'd have to I'd make you bring him to the dog beach. We got a dog beach here. He would go. Max, come here. Let me just show you this new ball he's got because it's very exciting. Come here. <laughs> I don't know if you usually do this. Pets on the show. Oh, the, you know what? Mine's usually behind me. Oh, nice little tennis ball there. Oh, very exciting. There we go. Now, what, what kind of dog is he? He's a cockapoo. I don't a know. Cockapoo. A cockapoo. I don't know if you've ever known a dog like Max that will get a bone bring it in the kitchen and drop it everywhere so all you hear is thud 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 and you know when you think just pick the bone up and go outside please you know uh -huh. it drags the whole and then you hear it being dragged around the kit anyway you know but, i understand i had an english bulldog named samson oh we, yeah we named him samson because he had big muscles and he loved women oh yeah and he, if, if, like if 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 I come home, he doesn't wake up. Like one of my dude friends would come over, he wouldn't even wake up. If you came to my house, mm. he would have lost his mind. Like he literally, would, when, when my wife would come home, he would vibrate. His forehead would, 
like like this. And his forehead would vibrate. He'd get so excited, his teeth would chatter. And he was dumb as a post. God bless him. He was dumb as a post. We just we just lost him. Um, but he um, yeah, he was in, he would humiliate us and embarrass us everywhere we went. You couldn't take him anywhere because he would publicly humiliate you and do do crazy things. But there was one time we were um, when I was dating my wife. Samson was, you know, there, and, and we were we were sitting and we were just watching a movie, and this smell of burning plastic, and I was like, and I thought I left something on the stove, maybe like you know, like a plastic you know, or something, and I, I was like, oh no, I'm, something's burning, and I'm looking around the house panicking, but we couldn't find it. There's nothing burning. So then we're sitting on the couch again, and we smell it again, burning plastic. And we're like, what is going on? So. We couldn't find it. And then all of a sudden we heard him. He tooted. He farted. And we smelled the burning plastic. And we're oh. like, oh, my gosh, what the heck is going on? And then so now we're looking around. We go to his dog bed. And he had eaten a plastic. Because we were, I was doing renovations because we were about to get married. And she was going to move into the house. So I was renovating the hall. So he had found a plastic paint scraper. And he ate it. Oh, jeez. He ate it. It smells burning plastic. Oh, no. oh, the joys of oh, parenthood. We've got, we've, we've let this interview slip to the lowest forms of the life. <laughs> and that's <laughs> why people watch. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's going to want to watch this, surely. But oh, no. Well, this one's going viral. <laughs> <laughs> so and that's how you know it's a good interview. That's yeah. a good interview. Yeah. Well, so, to brush it for a second. So yeah. what was the question again? About you know what makes you know, we were talking about the different kinds of brushes, filter uh, and this and that. What's the so difference? Long the handle usually for perspective and oil and acrylics, and short handle is for watercolors. Um, what I would say is watercolorists tend to use pointed rounds, um, but they, they can use lots of different shapes. There are lots of different shapes out there. And one thing to know is there's lots of shapes to help make your life easier. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if anyone writes this stuff down, but the 2230 that we do is a coma. It's a rake. If you type in coma on our website, it goes out like this. And the idea is it's really easy for fur, for grasses, for hair. I use it a lot when I paint my pet portraits. Yeah, people love them because it makes life easier. So mm -hmm. don't feel like you're a cheat. You're not a sellout or a cheat. At that point, you're just making your life a lot easier. Right. Yeah. Um, so the, the combers or the rakes are great for that. But then we also have some brushes where, you know, like a fan brush, you might say, and this is across the board, by the way, oil acrylic watercolor. Fan brushes are really great for, again, grasses, but also like the arcs on trees or building up foliage, mm -hmm. uh, things like that, that just make life easier. You can't get that from around as organically. Um, right. That's that whole right tool for the job. Right, exactly. So that's that's why you end up with so many ranges. I'd say for, for acrylic, um, folks love either filberts or flats usually. Some folks really enjoy a round as well, especially as you're getting into it, because it's really nice to draw in your acrylic and then paint into it. Um, a beginner entry level for sure right. um but the, but yeah making sure you remember that you use synthetics but try the both of them i mean just slightly off topic but keeping on topic is that a filbert is an oval shape flats are long and flat as opposed to a short flat which is kind of a square they end up like filberts anyway because the ends wear down. So right. flat become filberts, but in the other weird way, fil filberts after a while become flats. So, you, <clears throat> you know, I would say, it's up. Yeah. I would say um, try the two, try the two side by side. The nice thing I guess about filberts is, is that they don't keep an edge the same as a flat, so you can knock your edges back somewhat more. Right. Right. Um, that yeah, yeah, that's the big notice. You know, whenever I whenever I get a new brush, you know, one of the the, the first things I do is I'll take the brush and, uh -huh. and I'll load it up, and as I, I'll do a stroke like this, I'll come down and then I'll turn it, and I'll yeah. make it and if it makes a nice thick to a thin sharp zip, that's a good brush to make. Right. Well, no. I think. Um, but trying that with one of these versus one of these, whoop, there it is. Yeah. Um, 
it's going to make a very different stroke. Yeah, it is. I think um, I think the, the other piece of advice is always buy a size bigger than you think you need. Um, and, and yes. that's, that's only based on the fact of, that's not me as a brush maker going, happy days, we've sold lots of size 10s. It's, it's more of a loosen yourself up. You will not need that size smaller once you get that larger size and learn how to use it properly. Yeah. And that on its side, you know, it'd be like you said, Tim, a flat can turn out to be such an awesome liner brush, straight. Oh, yeah, you know, I, I, I see I see beginner painters are always trying to do line work with this. And I'm like, no. Not gonna help you. Not you gonna help you. You make a sharper, crisper line with this by using the edge. Well, good, this. good to, to mention at this point, for, for landscape painters especially, Flats tend to be really popular. If you want like a good gauge of what I know is popular for folks, flats, short flats and long flats tend to be really popular. Um, our ivory line and the evergreen line, which I know you use, Tim, um, tend to be, you know, like you go to start on those for, for your landscapes. And, and, and another advice across the board is do not go size one, two and three when you start now. Do yes. evens or odds so that you've got enough of a jump between the brushes. Um, you, you know, there's not noticeably enough of a difference between a five, six and a seven, but a five, seven and nine, now you're talking. Yeah. You know, that, that's, um, but I think, yeah, landscapes certainly flats, the ivory and the evergreen lines. I think um, if we talk flower painting and botanical, most flower painters enjoy filberts, um, because like we mentioned about that less than right. Edge on the sides for your petals and your stems and things, but also I think um, you really need to look at the angular brushes um, because they they've got like um, well if I could draw it I should have bought a pen but it's it's not it's more like that kind of shape right right it's more of like a parallelogram it's not yeah yeah like a like triangle but slightly off okay it's got like the the edge instead of being square like this it has almost like a 45 degree angle exactly. that's yeah. it too. Yeah. That's yeah. yeah yeah and why that's so good is because it allows you to cut in chisel yeah broadly on its side but you can also use yeah. it really for long thin Andrew lines Tischler uses those brushes on pretty much everything yeah, loves them. The Tish daggers. Yeah, yeah. The tish daggers. Yeah, he uses those. I like the um, and I and I use the swords quite a bit. Um, and those are like they're kind of like that, but they're really long and they come to a point. They're those like a liner. They're like a liner, but better. Yeah. I know, Max. We still yeah. talking. <laughs> this is. Can you see how he puts his arm like that? That's how he's he arm around you. That's 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 mm -hmm. gorgeous. That is just adorable. So. That the this are really, um, really good for thin, fine lines, rigging on chips, um, uh, hair. Um, some people even use them for signatures. A good signature brush, by the way, is a little pointed round. Um, you can use uh, um, Sable, I'd say, the Series 99s. You only need a size zero, so it's like three or four bucks. But this is another tip, Tim. Keep your signature brush separate. Don't then be tempted to, to use that for something else. It'll last you a lifetime if you just use it for your signatures. You know right. what I mean? So, yeah, I, I definitely would say um, keep a little little brush separate. But back to, to, to botanical then, I'd say the mainstay, this isn't the rules, but it's an idea. Filberts definitely and, and angulars. Um, for portraiture... Folks tend to use longer filberts and shorter filberts. Longer filberts because they give you the, um, hang on, like the plainness of the face here. But the short filberts are great for the corners of the eyes, corners of the nose, and corners of the mouth. Right. You know? So it's, um, that then it, it, it's really useful to, to try and use a longer length brush with portraiture where you can. Um, yeah. What I would say is, the longer length brushes, even though they look more difficult, make your life easier. 
because you don't have to load the brush to the end near the ferrule and clean them that way. They, they clean far easier. But they right. also give you that bit more leverage that you might need on your paint to stop your arm moving. Right. You know, and that and that's the real thing. You know, so many people, I, I always get on to my students that is, you know, they hold their paintbrush like a pencil here. And I'm like, hold it like chopsticks. Let the brush bend, you know, let those yeah. brushes bend. Let them do the work of a paintbrush. Yeah. You know, like which end is moving more? This end. That's the wrong end. There's no paint on that end. So you want to be able to have that brush control. I think a good tip would be start holding your brush. Well, the the better tip, I've got so many things I'm trying to think of to try and but it is is really try and think out the box of how you hold your brush yes so, like you're saying that it's so easy intrinsically because of how we write it's too easy to remember to do it like this mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be that you can hold it a further back but think about how you hold the brush so you can yeah. hold it like this you can mm -hmm. hold it like that you can hold it like that you can hold it like that think of how you hold the brush mm -hmm. to make you know make it work for you right um, and that that's really important for brush control yes and and control so. and all that. yeah how you hold it you know it's like way back when i got out of the military in uh, 1995 mm -hmm. uh, is when i got out of the military i opened an airbrush shop on the beach i remember you telling me that i think yeah yeah and uh, that was way back in the day when you know, if you came to if you came to the beach of Florida and you didn't go home with an airbrush T-shirt, you didn't go on vacation. Just yeah. how it was. it was that big a deal. Every store on the beach had an airbrush shop in it, and those airbrush guys were making a thousand dollars a day cash. It was just crazy, and so it was just it was a wild time. And yeah. uh, but when you were learning to airbrush, the first thing you did was you got this giant bed sheet. And you would you would airbrush little swirls, and you did that. You filled the sheet with that, and it taught you how to control the gun, the airbrush gun. Yeah, learn your brush by doing strokes. Play with those strokes. Learn the brush. You, you obviously you're familiar with Richard Schmidt. He makes his students or suggests to his students to do color charts. They're invaluable. If yeah. nobody's heard of those, just Google Richard Schmidt color charts. Um, yeah. And it's something like that, that it pays off dividends. It is yeah. such a thing to do it. But once you've done it, you know what you're doing. Oh, you yeah. know? And it's the same with your brushes. You're right. Pick up your brushes this weekend. And where you've got a point on the end of it, try it every other way. Just for, for, for fun, on your palette. You don't even need yep. to use your pencil, your panel, or your board, or your paper. Mm -hmm. Just try it within your palette. But then try it holding it like that and, and like that, you know, and, and moving your wrist. That's, that's exactly. a really great These are great, great pieces of advice. You know, it's like it's one thing to have a super quality brush, but it's another thing to know how to use it and yep. use it properly and use it effectively. You know, it's a brush. How does a brush work? Let the brush do what it was designed to do. And yeah, I've got one for you that you, you should do for your followers, uh, not now, but in, in a couple of weeks if you get the time to do, is pull out all your brushes and do three or four or six strokes with each one of the brushes to show them what you can, you know, like proofs in the pudding type thing. Look yeah. what I can do. Um, and, I, and I'm sure Great idea. I'll well, write this one down. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure you'll get a lot of people watch could because Pat, uh, what, what's the phrase? Knowledge is power. Yep. We want you and we think, ah, Tim's done it like that. I know that I can do that. But I, why didn't he do it like that? And they'll be thinking in their heads, why didn't he do it like that? But you, you know, people then share on and on and on. So, and it's, it's um, you know, like a, a snowball effect of let's try and utilize the brush fully. And that yeah. means the full length of the handle too, for a reason, mm -hmm. you know. Excellent. Well, wow, we went... Uh... We went over time, which is awesome. You know, the great thing about these, oh, it doesn't matter because it's the internet. We can go five hours, two hours, one hour, it doesn't matter. Listen, but if we went to another hour, I'd be getting a glass of wine out. So I just... <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. I always tell my students the key to good painting is more wine. Yes. It's very 
in, in England right now, it is quarter past four in the afternoon. Not oh. a drink before seven, I just want to say. But <laughs> I'm just making it clear. That's funny. That's funny. But this is a, this was a really, really great interview. Um, I really want to thank you for coming on. We'll have to have you on again in the future. And uh, I'm hoping once this pandemic is done and we can all go outside, that we will see you back here on the beach. Um, now, are you going to be at the uh, – I know that the um, Portrait Society of America is going to be in August now in Orlando. Are you guys going to be there? Portrait Society is August. Plain Air Convention is August. Um, what I can say without saying too much is we are case by case, day by day, looking at it um, because things are very different over here than what they are over there. Um, yes. The moment that the, our government are saying that we're probably not going to be um, socially interacting with people till the end of the year, um, and in wow. which you know that's it's pretty tight schedule. At the moment, we can't fly anyway. Um, you know. Who knows? What I will say is, if we are going to be there, it'll be very clearly well known that we'll be there. And if we're not, then we'll miss everybody. But it's for the right reasons if we yeah. are to be there. Absolutely. Um, but at the moment, we're judging it day by day. Like I said, I think that's honestly the best way to say it. That I'm not then saying we're 100 percent going to be there, folks, because we might not be. But right. at the moment, we are um, thinking positive to hopefully be there. Yeah, optimism is the key. So, yeah. yeah, that'll be great. Well, Simi, thank you very much for coming on. Um, go ahead and stay on a little bit. Uh, I'm going to do our little finish up things here, and sure. then uh, we will um, talk a little bit before we go. So, let me go ahead and click this. I know what I'm doing. I really do. There we go. There we go. Hey, well, guys, what do you think? I think today was a really great video. Um, Man, uh, Rosemary Brushes, that was a great conversation. We talked about everything from paintbrushes to, you know, synthetics and, and uh, down to natural hairs. And we talked about fly fishing. We talked about dogs eating uh, paint scrapers. We talked about a little bit of everything today. But I hope that you enjoyed it. I always enjoy it. Uh, again, thank you to Simi and uh, Rosemary uh, and company brushes guys if you I'm gonna put her name on the screen here real quick so you guys can get that address one more time uh, yes. yes I want to say one more thing yes go ahead I'm gonna take me Sorry, off to interrupt, but I think this is really important yes. I'm gonna offer all of your watchers right now <sighs> shipping for this weekend this weekend only so it'll finish at 12 o'clock on Sunday night I don't know why I, I didn't even think to do it, and I just thought that then it'd be a good idea. So I'm so sorry to interrupt your time. You, oh, you no. no, this is awesome. Free shipping. All you've got to do is put your order through the website as normal, put in the notes section. I watched Tim and Simmy this weekend. Okay, so it'll run out, Tim, at the end of this weekend. So midnight, wherever you are, on whatever time frame. Basically, when I come to download the orders on Monday morning, it stops, okay? Nice. Mum will kill me. But um, <laughs> only for airmail. Only for the airmail option, okay? Not for FedEx. Otherwise, it's just too expensive for us. Sure. Um, wow. We'll put the bill to help folks who are painting from home. Um, yeah, we'll definitely put the bill for them on airmail. So anybody that wants to order this weekend, there you go, Tim. Wow. Well, thank you very much. That is awesome. Oh my gosh. Well, thank you. That is fantastic. I love it. Thank you very much. Wow. God. Did you hear that guys? Whoa. Free shipping. You got to take advantage of it guys. And, and I'll say this uh, straight up, right? Right there. I, I think I got this. There we go. Um, Rosemary and co.com is the website um it's really well worth it guys i'm going to just show this in the stream here um so you can see what i'm talking about um let's see here i know how to do this um where did it go there it is here i want to show you their website real quick um there it is this is this is their website um and you can see it right here uh, Rosemary and Company brushes. You've got watercolor, acrylic, oil brushes. I'm in the oil section now. Uh, if I click here, this is their main website. 
So if you go to this website, guys, over this weekend and you place an order, um, she will give you free shipping on the airmail. That is fantastic. Uh, you guys definitely want to take advantage of that. I can't recommend that enough. These brushes are absolutely fantastic. Well, hey, guys, uh, I just want to say, again, thank you for watching. Um, again, if you can uh, hit the like button, hit the share button, tell your friends about it. Um, you know, these videos, every week we've got a different uh, modern master artist on here. I try to bring you the best artists uh, that I know of. And so we've got a bunch coming up that I think you guys are going to love. Um, with that said, guys, just remember, I'm your old pal, Tim. God loves you. And so do I. We'll talk with you later.